Okay. Uh, good morning, friends. As usual, we are back again. Saturday, our morning breakfast, knowledge breakfast, and we are uh, which will lead up to lunch. So you can digest your lunch well. Uh, today's topic. obligations of debt listed entities under sebi listing regulations uh i can understand the many people who are uh, considering debt only as a debt for listing they will be interested but friends this is a future also that uh, you remember the finance ministry and the government was concerned that our debt market was not deep the deepness was not there and it was required to promote the debt market and at that time to promote uh, listing debt listing so few years back only debt listing was in a you, you know was accepted well and then the government thought that will regulate less that was the assurance and there was very minimum regulation for debt listing that was the point so everyone thought that let's get debt listed and many people many companies has debt listed and the debt listing become then little vibrant but slowly and steadily zor ka jhatka dheere se lage the regulation has started coming and the uh, your control and the disclosure like csr we also observed slowly 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 but now we are habitual that debt listing will be also subject to control regulation disclosures and all that and it's coming so today we are there that the, now so many companies are debt listed and the debt market is also becoming active so so many companies are concerned with the obligations of the listed entity whose uh, debt securities are listed and today's topic is pertaining to that and uh, we have with us as a panelist mr shan uh, deputy vice president company secretary and compliance of hinduja leyland finance limited welcome mr shan yeah good morning happy good. to join this webinar thanks good morning to all the participants thank you and of course we have with us sudhakar and bala as usual and we have today's presentation by ms chami management trainee of mehta and mehta friends uh, we are always endeavoring that our trainees are forefront and we insist that trainees give presentation because they are the future of our profession if they are confident and they can be doing public speaking our professional will be represented by in future by them and today that charmi is going to prove that because i already heard that she has done a wonderful job so let's hope to do that best now formally introduce mr sham Mr. Sun holds master's degree in law from Jindal Global Law School. Fellow member of ICSI, I insolvency professional registered with IBBI. Postgraduate diploma in uh, PG DBA Finance Management, Symbiosis, Pune. Indian Institute of Banking certified in NBFC operation. CII certified CSR professional. and has over 22 plus years of experience on compliance legal secretarial domain in various sectors such as consulting manufacturing it and finance service industry is a member of auditing standard board of icsi past member of expert group on auditing standard board of icsi past member of secretarial standard board of icsi He is thought leader with research article published in various professional journals and publication of ICSI, and regular speaker and panelist at various forums on compliance, corporate governance, and legal domains. Presently, he is with Hinduja Leyland Finance Limited as a deputy vice president, company secretary, and compliance officer. Welcome, Mr. Shan. Yeah, thank you once again. Yeah, Mr. Shan. Uh, now I'll request Mr. Shan to say a few words on the topic. Then Mr. Sudhakar and Mr. Bala, and then Charmi, you can take it, the presentation. Yeah. Over to Mr. Shan. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good morning to all the participants and um, other uh, co-panelists and the officials from Mehta and Mehta. As you may be aware, that you know most of the time the focus was on the equity listed companies, corporate governance norms, and the evolving you know regulatory regime. 
but off late a lot of uh, traction has been gaining on the dead listing front and today there is not uh, no much difference between an equity listed entity and uh, especially an high value debt listed entity where almost all the semi listing regulations norms are applicable you know maybe except for the shareholding pattern a high value debt listed entity complies with almost all the uh, uh, listing regulations you know provisions and in terms of complexity i would say that you know compared to an equity listed company debt listing is much more you know uh, tougher because you don't have an universe of universe of you know uh, companies where you can have a benchmark you have a reference or you have a comparison and all that in terms of the universe of debt listed companies it's very compared compared to equity it is very less and in terms of you know uh, certain scale of companies also it's not you know as similar to equity listed companies so managing the compliances of a debt listed company is much more you know onerous and you know it, it, it's it has its own uh, pros and cons compared to an equity listed company and there are multiple regulations applicable for debt listed entities for example you know sebi listing regulation sebi ncs regulation there are various circulars operational circulars issued by sebi so this is something different from you know the circulars and guidelines and you know issued by uh, sebi for equity listed entities so one has to be you know consciously you know keeping uh, keep track of all these updates apart from that the stock exchanges both bse and nse also issues various circulars specifically for uh, debt listed entities and one of the other important aspect which all the debt listed entities have to bone in mind is that you know this insider regulating regulations are also applicable to them so all compliances including the sgd compliances they need to be mindful of because the regulations uses the word securities which includes the debt securities so earlier there used to be some sort of confusion as to whether a purely debt listed entity has to comply with insider trading regulations but it was always applicable because of the term uh, securities used in the regulations so i think with that i will leave it open for the no presentation or the other panelists to speak yes sir doctor yeah good morning uh, everyone and uh, after three weeks again i'm joining back i was on leave and i could not attend all the three webinars in fact i was missing it very much and uh, again uh, back to the pavilion and uh, thanks sean and uh, over and above what deepthi has introduced sean is uh, i found him as a very meticulous and thorough professional and no non nonsensical person and uh, i had the privilege of working with him in the ssb for almost 2 to 3 years really enjoyed that time thanks sean for accepting our invitation thank you sir for your nice kind comments as a panelist today Thank and you. sean has already uh, sounded about the importance of the debt listing provisions and participants you may agree with me that you will have i mean the participants had a very rarest of the opportunity as far as that to listen to the debt listing regulations in fact several times from the institute i spoke about the listing regulations but whenever you ask the organizers should i take up debt listing they said no sir not not necessary chapter 4 is sufficient chapter 3 is sufficient i never touched chapter 5 in fact and okay that i used to say always i used to be a bit nervous in when i was in reliance that because our debt was listed and our uh, equity was also listed so we were to comply with both debt listing as well as equity listing compliances for equity listing compliances you always find a precedence because wherever you have any kind of uh, uh, clarification you require somebody or the other would have already dealt with that which was not the case with debt listed companies so debt listing always used to be a complex subject and uh, even the programs what were organized are also very few and so i think you know deepthi is known for organizing unique programs and this is one of such program we were when we were uh, toying with the idea should we go with the debt listing regulations whether we have that kind of participation deepthi now you are happy we have hit the century just now you know that 100 people have reached that yeah, target yeah should be <laughs> <laughs> because nowadays you know deepthi has a lot of hunger you know she don't uh, be happy with the two numericals she always want three numericals before we start the program so we have already it is there so as far no, as the subject is concerned the importance uh, of the topic actually the number of participants yeah <laughs> so as shan has already mentioned the most important thing was that even in case of a private limited company if it has its debt listed 
for all purposes it is a listed company only and especially that even the pit regulations are applicable till recently in fact you know, about a year before when we came with the guidance note on pit regulations that point till such time there were several companies were under a uh, assumption that it is not applicable to debt list uh, I mean, debt listed companies it is purely applicable to the equity listed companies only so we clarified that very well in the uh, guidance note of pit regulations that is equally applicable to debt listed companies also when we were making the provision among the uh, members of the ssb itself we were uh, rechecking it thoroughly whether it is really applicable or not applicable but it was we have concluded that yes pit regulations are equally applicable to debt listed companies each and everything in the pit regulations is applicable so even if you are a company secretary of a private limited company the moment your debt is listed on the stock exchanges please ensure that your company is a listed company for all purposes unless there are certain exemptions provided recently in the amendment of i think if i am not wrong companies amendment act 2020 congress yeah, amendment yeah 2020 unless it is so then you have to be uh, on your nose as far as uh, chapter 5 is concerned as far as bit regulations is concerned as far as other provisions are concerned so i give a pause here and I request bala sir to take it forward thank you good morning to all of you i welcome you all on behalf of my own and also on behalf of meta and meta one thing as a panelist said very clearly that debt listing, there are a lot of compliances. We need to be more careful when compared to equity. But from the business perspective, if we look at it, why companies want to go for the debt? Because one major, major advantage in debt rising is the current management don't have to dilute their management and control because the stake remains with them only because unless in the equity, the ownership goes with them and the, they get involved in the control, etc. Those sort of the things are not there. That is one. And the second thing is there in case of the debt, what happens is there's all the flexible plans is actually possible. Because you can actually fix what is the repayment term, you can pre-agree what is the interest payable, etc. and other thing and that you have a flexibility to fix in terms of the business. So this is the business advantages mainly there. And second thing is coming to the taxation point of view, what happens is in case of the equity, the return to the equity shareholders is by way of the dividend. Dividend is actually done only out of the profit. This is the appropriation of the profit. But in case of the debt, what happens is, this is interest what is actually payable to the debt holders. They are actually chargeable to the p and account, it is actually tax deductible. So there are various advantages or there is the reason for the debt market is actually growing up. People actually would like to raise capital. And another thing is there, it also from the perspective of servicing the debt holders is much easier compared to the equity holders. That is also another advantage. But however, why so many regulations? That is the question which actually comes. Because the hard-earned money has been put by the people who are actually lending the money to the company. So always the regulators wanted to safeguard. Even that is the same case in case of the equity as well. But in the debt, it is actually more so. That is why a lot of regulations has actually come into play. As uh, Sudhagar puts it very clearly, even if the private limited company is actually listed in debts, then again, the pit regulation is applicable, which many people were not aware of it sometime back. Now the awareness is actually happening. So from that perspective, today, I think Chami is going to take us through the various uh, provisions, especially with the reference to the company side, especially with the reference to the listing regulation, etc. And also there have been very recent amendments. She is uh, touching upon that. Definitely, definitely this session will actually give us about the debt market, the compliances, etc. In fact, a lot of things we have to take care when it comes to the debt market compliances. Professional have got a lot of job, a lot of thinking, a lot of uh, diligence is to be exercised. I think with our expert panelist, Mr. Shanmuham, on the board, I think we'll have a lot of insight from him. We will have the practical experiences of, from him. And I'm sure this seminar is going to be really, really a knowledge adding seminar at the altogether a new topic to many of the people here. That's all I ask Chami to proceed with the presentation. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. I would like you all to welcome to the webinar uh, where our topic is obligations of debt listed entities under SEBI listing regulations. Yeah, Jai Yeah, is my screen visible to all? Yeah, very much. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. You can make it in the presentation mode. Yes, sir. So first of all, here I have defined the regulations pertaining to the debt securities. First of all, what is debt security? Debt security is basically defined under regulation 2, subregulation 1, clause K of SEBI, NCS regulations 2021, which means that non-convertible securities are a securities with a, a fixed maturity period, which will create or acknowledge a charge or indebtedness and includes the ventures or any other securities whether it consists of a charge or on assets or properties or not. However, it specifically excludes the security receipts, securitized debt instruments, also money market instruments, which are regulated by the Reserve Bank of India or any other bodies as which may be specified by the board from time to time. Moving forward, here we'll be discussing your, uh, the benefits of issuing uh, debt securities. So first is uh, it enhances the it, it is an efficient way to raise raise a capital by which the company can raise funds. It also enhances the visibility and the company profile. So here many uh, listed uh, this listing of the NCDs it creates an attention for listed companies by informing a wider group of potential buyers for their goods and uh, listing on a capital exchange also increases the external and internal visibility of the business. So it gradually reinforces in the view of the customers, shareholders and other stakeholders of the business to have its goal and how it is going to fulfill its obligations and it will comply with the regulatory requirements. It also aims to increase the liquidity. So the liquidity provided by the debt securities allows the company to raise long term debt securities as an individual investors can exit when cash flow is needed. So therefore, debt listed securities are sold at a lower interest rate and as liquidity rate is reduced also significantly. Mm -hmm. Coming to the well-regulated secondary trading, it is an also, uh, it also regulates uh, various NCDs so that the public are uh, secured about the investments that they are going to make. It, it is also used as a medium of tax savings. Yeah, a few more points here. From the investors and the <clears throat> regulators point of view, debt listing will also lead to will also lead to higher level of corporate governance in the uh, debt listed entities, enhanced disclosures. And because it's a debt and you know, they need to get the credit rating done, it will also lead to larger scrutiny of the company's you know, financials and operations, which is always you know, good for the investors and the regulators. Yeah, go ahead. So here, uh, what are basically debt markets? Debt markets are basically for the issuance, trading and settlement of various types and features of fixed income securities. So what are uh, fixed income securities? They can be issued by any legal entity like central or state governments, public bodies or statutory corporations, banks and institutions and corporate bodies. So a debenture being an attractive source of funding is a long term debt instrument which is issued by corporates and governments to secure fresh funds or capitals. Here I've represented a chart where uh, we can see how the public uh, issuance of corporate debts are uh, going forward in the last 10 years. So we can just identify here from this thing that companies are preferring to list their NCDs and uh, raise capital from the investors. So the company issues non-convertible debentures to attract the lenders and investors which come with a higher interest rate. So here, basically, the role of a corporate bond market becomes even more important given the stress on banking sector. So here are the two segments of debt markets. First is the government securities market, which can be issued by zero coupon bonds, floating rate bonds, and T-bills. However, in corporate securities markets, there are also three types of bonds that can be issued, which, uh, which are uh, forest, foreign investment bonds, uh, public sector unit bonds, and debenture or corporate bonds. So coming to uh, what is a debenture, debenture is basically a document which evidences a debt or it acknowledges it. 
it usually has a contract for repayment of a principal after a specific period of time or at intervals or at, as the option may be decided by the company for payment of interest and at a fixed rate that is payable usually either on half yearly or yearly basis and on the very fixed date so uh, debentures are, are of two types usually on the basis of convertibility there are uh, convertible debentures and non convertible debentures on the basis of uh, security there are secured debentures and unsecured debentures so section 2 sub regulation uh, sub section 30 of companies act defines debenture as which includes debenture stock bonds or any other instrument of a company evidencing a debt whether constituting a charge on the assets of the company or not company also issues non convertible uh, uh, charme uh, just go back to the previous slide yes sir see here i want to add only one thing uh, the security may be a convertible debenture or non convertible debenture and both can be listed on the stock exchanges when you list your convertible securities that is uh, convertible debentures chapter 5 is not applicable but chapter 4 is applicable to you the reason being that any convertible security that fall under the definition of specified securities so because for specified securities chapter 4 is applicable and for non convertible debt securities chapter 5 is applicable and if your company is having purely non convertible debt securities you don't need to worry about chapter 4 unless until your company is a high value debt listed entity if it is high value debt listed entity then regulation 16 to regulation 27 are applicable to you apart from chapter 5 if it is not a high value debt listed entity purely chapter 5 is only applicable chapter 4 is not applicable to you yeah go ahead yeah. Yeah, so company issues non convertible debentures to attract the lenders and investors that come with the higher interest rate and after the securities are issued and listed the companies uh, fall under the jurisdiction of sebi and they are obligated to adhere to their various regulations in addition while complying to the uh, companies act and uh, applicable rbi guidelines or circulars so following are the governing framework for a debt listed entity it comprises of companies act Companies share capital and debenture rules 2014, Companies prospectus and allotment of securities rule 2014, SEBI NCS regulations 2021, uh, SEBI uh, ICDR regulations 2018, SEBI LODR regulations 2015, and RBI guidelines. So here, as Sudhakar sir rightly said, that uh, issue of debt securities can be done by way of public issue and also by way of private placement. if uh, it is done in the way of public issue then listing on the stock exchange gets mandatory however while it is done in the mode of private placement listing is optional for the companies then applicability of regulations if the convertible if the company issues convertible debt securities then the company has to follow sebi icdr regulations however the company if it if it is issuing non convertible debt securities then they have to follow sebi lodr regulations and sebi ncs regulations so post listing they have they'll have to comply with the sebi lodr regulations and uh, pursuant to regulation uh, section 40 of companies act 2013 every company making a public offer shall before making such offer it it has to make an application to one or more recognized stock exchange and they have to obtain the permission for the securities to be dealt with on such exchanges chami uh, can you just go to the previous slide just one point i would like to highlight your sir no the one prior to this In terms of RBI guidelines, RBI has issued a circular dated 20th February 2015, which is you know relating to raising money through private placement by NCDs by the NBFCs. So NBFCs have to be mindful of these guide you know circular issued by RBI, and the circular also specifies the companies to especially NBFCs to have a specific policy on this, you know raising money through uh, raising funds through NCDs. And uh, in terms of uh, SEBI LODR, there is uh, one operational circular issued by SEBI. dated 29 july 2022 updated up to december 1st december 2022 this has all the formats and other related you know uh, circulars uh, on the, the ncd this uh, debt listing part of it so one has to be mindful of this sebi operational circular and the one more point which i would like to highlight is that as per the prospectus and allotment rules There is a time limit of you know one year validity for this special resolution uh, passed by the shareholders for the uh, raising of funds through debentures actually NCDs. If the limit 
it does not exceed 181c then board approval would suffice if the limit exceeds 181c every year the company has to pass a special resolution so the validity of the resolution remains well you know for a one year period so one has to be mindful of that in terms of your fundraising plans basically yeah that's it you can go ahead cha yes sir So moving forward, here are the compliances which will pertain to SEBI LODR regulations 2015. So uh, regulation 49 to 63 of Chapter 5 deals with uh, companies which have listed its specified securities and either non-convertible securities or non-convertible uh, redeemable preference shares or both. So specified securities have the same meaning as they are assigned to it under uh, SEBI ICDR regulations, which basically means equity shares and convertible securities. Yeah, someone has asked a query on what is the chapter four and chapter five. See, chapter four is applicable to all equity listed companies as well as uh, for high value debt listed entities from regulation 16 to 27. In case if the debt listed entity is not a high value debt listed entity, then they need to uh, comply only with chapter five, which is purely applicable for you know only uh, uh, other than high value debt listed entities. That is the difference between chapter four and five actually. There is one more question is also there on yeah. insider trading regulation applicable or privately placed listed NCDs that debt are high value debts. Yeah, insider trading regulations is applicable for any, you know, even a privately placed listed uh, debentures because, you know, the term used in the insider trading regulations is the word, you know, securities, which includes debt securities as well. So almost all the compliances as per insider trading has to be done, including the code of fair disclosure, code of internal code of conduct. SGD compliance, closing, closure of trading window during the quarterly results. All this has to be done. And one more thing is that if your company is uh, again a listed subsidiary of an equity listed entity, then that UPSI, all that will be relevant because accounts are getting consolidated. Uh, the, the only difference is that if the company is a purely debt listed company, the unpublished price sensitive information definition slightly changes. Because hmm. the opposite there is only if it is affecting the listed securities. Correct. So listed securities are debt securities. So any information, if it is affecting the debt securities, then only it becomes unpublished price sensitive information. If it is affecting its equity shares, but anyway, they are not listed in the stock exchanges. So that effectiveness will not be there. So that is the only thing that as a company secretary of a debt listed company, you have to be careful enough. Correct. The point is that if it is again a subsidiary of equity listed entity where the accounts are getting consolidated, any you know financial okay. information of this subsidiary might be price sensitive for the holding company because it's getting consolidated. Correct. Well, somebody is asking a question Can optionally convertible securities be issued under you? Yes, will it be a debt or equity? See, optionally convertible securities, uh, I mean, look at, uh, till the time they are not, if you see the uh, definition of the, uh, what's called as the you know, okay, uh, specified securities, only compulsorily convertible securities are falling in the definition of specified securities, otherwise not. So optionally convertible securities, till the time they are not opted, they will be treated as debt securities only. Correct. Right. Compulsorily convertible debentures, compulsorily convertible preference yeah, shares, yeah. and global depository receipts, that is GDRs. Only these three are falling under the definition of specific specified securities. And for specified securities, compliances of Chapter 4 are required. Somebody has put up a question. If the circular is on the quantum of the creation of the debenture redemption reserve, fund still exist? The debenture redemption reserve is, as per the Companies Act provisions, it is exempted only for NBFCs, actually. Go ahead, Chavi. Yes, sir. So here, as uh, Shan sir and Sudhakar sir said that uh, if a company is a high value debt listed entity, then it uh, has to comply with the provisions from regulation 16 to 27 onwards. So this pursuant to SEBI LODR regulations where they, are, they had issued an amendment on 14th June, which is now applicable from 15th July onwards. It states that uh, regulation 15, subregulation 1A of uh, SEBI LODR regulations defines a high value debt listed entity. 
So a listed entity which has listed its non-convertible debt securities of an outstanding value of listed non-convertible debt securities of rupees 500 crore and above shall be considered as a high value debt listed entity. And the company shall be determined on the basis of its value of principal outstanding of debt listed securities as on March 31st, 2021. So provided that in case an entity that has listed its non-convertible securities triggers the specified threshold of rupees 500 crores during the course of the year, then it has to ensure that it complies with the provisions of uh, this uh, CG uh, for within six months from the date of such trigger. And if the company uh, has to pro uh, comply with this within six months, if the company is not able to, then they have to uh, pro provide an explanation or uh, to the uh, stock exchanges until March 31st, 2024. Yeah, one point I would like to highlight here, in case of companies which are not high value debt listed entities, but you know below the threshold, it is ideal that they do plan for you know uh, becoming a high value listed entity because at some point of time because of the fundraising plans and all that they may become a high value debt listed entity in due course of time so it is better to prepare in advance because the moment you hit the threshold the compliance requirements are much more you know larger so it be it will become you know very difficult to transition in a very short time actually so it is ideal that they start the process uh, much earlier and uh, one more thing is that on the compliant or explained basis what they have extended till 31st March 2024 now. Nowhere in the regulations it has been uh, very clearly given how do you report to the regulator in case you are not complying or how do you explain it to the regulator. Probably in the corporate governance report where you can give some remarks in some of the compliances. But other than that, there seems to be no avenue prescribed by SEBI in terms of, you know, how do you report your, uh, no, how do you explain your non-compliance or on your, uh, no, you are about to comply at a later time. That is not given. Probably in the annual report, one may have to make a disclosure. Any thoughts from you, Sudhakar, on this? Yeah, I agree with you, sir. I agree with you. Yeah, go ahead, John. Yes, sir. So applicability of LODR on debt listed entity uh, states that uh, if the company has outstanding value of its listed non-convertible debt securities of rupees 500 crores and above, then they also have to uh, comply with chapter four that is corporate governance norms from regulation 16 to 27 of SEBI LODR regulation. And also with chapter five, which states about obligations of listed entity, which has listed its non-convertible securities. And where the listed entity has an outstanding value of listed non-convertible securities below rupees 500 crore, then they'll only have to comply with chapter 5 of LODR regulations. So pursuant uh, to the SEBI LODR regulations, here there are the timelines given for a high value debt listed entity as on 31st March 2021. They have to either comply or explain till the 31st March 2024. However, it is mandatory from 1st April 2024 to them. Earlier, they had stated that uh, it was only uh, on explain or comply basis till March 30, 31st, 2023, which has now been extended up to March 2024. And also for high uh, debt listed entities which become higher value in future, they'll have to comply within six months from the, debt, uh, from the date that uh, they have become a high value debt listed entity. And either they'll have to either comply or explain uh, till 31st March 2024. So here an explanation has been given by uh, SEBI LODR regulations where uh, that what does the comply or explain mean? It states that the company shall endeavor that it complies with the provisions of corporate governance norms fully by March 31st, 2024. And in case if the company is not able to achieve the full compliance with the provisions, then they have to explain the reasons for uh, why they have not complied or either if they have also partially complied to these regulations, they need to uh, explain this to uh, uh, SEBI. And also they have to provide them the steps that they have initiated to achieve what are the compliances that they are uh, planning to achieve the quarterly compliance uh, governance report. There is a question has actually come. A company was a high value debt listed entity as on 31st March 22. But the company has been 60% of its debt paid as on 31st March 23. What would be the situation of the chapter 4? See, the moment it comes below the threshold of 500 crores, it will not, it will cease to be a high value debt listed entity because that is the threshold limit given. So,
So in that case, probably the company has to write to the exchange if they are sure that they are not going to again come back to a status of a high value delisted entity. They'll have to write to the exchange and clarify this. Criteria is to be determined of the entity basis either standard or, or consolidated basis. Standalone. Standalone. This is on the debt raised by the company, no? So there if is no company, question of consolidation there. If a company has a losses, does it require to create DRR? How can you create a DRR when you are into losses? <laughs> DRR is to be created out of profits. Profits. So as and when you commit to profits, you have to create DRR for the past years also. Right. Compulsory convertible debentures in the equity share bin again will get fresh list approval of equity or same to be considered for exchange approval, chapter 4. They'll have to get a fresh approval. Yeah, yeah, because the trading will be now in the equity, so yeah. you know to get the approval. Yes, correct. That is because right. your ISNI also will change, no? Nah, yeah, correct. Yeah. See, the, the only difference is that when you are coming with uh, compulsory convertible debentures, you have to have in principle approval of the stock exchange. So when at the time of conversion, you don't need to have the in principle approval because that is already in place. Hmm. Only thing is that you have to convert the share and then get that fresh uh, equity shares listed as against the uh, CCDS. And of course, as Sean rightly mentioned, even the ISR number will also get changed. What, what if the company is only CP listed and only CP operational circular and RBA regulations on CP listings applicable, PAT regulation as an insider transaction is not applicable? See, in terms of only CP listed company, there is a separate circular by uh, SEBI. Companies have to comply with that actually. I think CP is not a security. Yeah. Commercial paper is not a security. Yeah, that's yeah. Why... CP is not coming under the securities actually, really speaking. That's why if your company is purely CP listed company, then you don't need to comply with any of the listing regulations or bit regulations. Correct, sir. I agree with you. Go ahead, Chabit. Yes, sir. So here from 15th July onwards, uh, SEBI regulations have also included a real, in, a real estate investment trust and infrastructure investment trust also. So where the company is a high value debt, where the high value debt listed entity is a real estate investment trust, then the company has to ensure that the board of manager of REIT shall also comply with the uh, regulation 15 to regulation 27 pertaining to corporate governance. And also in the same manner, if the high value debt, debt listed entity is an infrastructure investment trust, then it uh, then also the board of manager has uh, has to comply with regulations 15 to 27 which pertains to the corporate governance then where uh, where reit is registered under sebi uh, real estate investment trust regulations 2014 then governance norms as per those regulations shall be applicable to the company and uh, where uh, infrastructure investment trust is registered under sebi infrastructure investment trust regulations 2014 then the governance norms as per those regulations shall be applicable to the, uh, to that company. So once a company is a, a high value debt listed entity, the following immediate action points are applicable to the companies. For example, they'll have to align the composition of board of directors as per regulation 17. All the committees as per regulation 18 to uh, 21 have to be followed. Then also uh, various policies and uh, drafting of such policies will be applicable to, uh, to all the entities. All the related party transactions as per regulation 33 of uh, LODR regulations will be applicable to the debt listed entities and obligations with respect to independent directors and corporate governance norms shall also be applicable to them. So uh, dealing with regulation 17, it states that the uh, as soon as the entity is identified as a high value debt listed entity, the composition of the board shall be as follows. The board shall have an optimum combination of executive and non-executive directors out of which at least one should be a woman director and not less than 50 directors should be non-executive directors on the board. And where the chairperson is a non-executive director, then at least one third of the board of directors shall be independent directors. And where a, cha a chairperson is not a non-executive director, then half of the board of directors shall be independent. 
uh, and a special resolution for appointing or continuing the directorship as a non executive director of any person above the uh, age of 75 shall be only done by way of special resolution and um, approval of shareholders for appointment or reappointment of a person on board of directors as manager uh, or uh, to be taken at at the next general meeting or within 3 months whichever is earlier so here uh, from 15th july onwards uh, the, these three points have been added for high value real estate entity as well as equity listed entities that uh, the continue continuation of a director on the board of director of listed entity shall be subject to approval of shareholders in the general meeting at least once uh, sorry at least once in 5 years from the date of appointment or reappointment of such a, a thing with effect from april 1 2024 and where the director is serving on the board of directors as on march 31st 2024 without any approval of the shareholders for last 5 years or more it shall be subject to the approval of shareholders in the first general meeting to be held after 31st march 2024 and any casual vacancy in the office of director it shall be filled at the earliest but not later than 3 months from the date of such vacancy yeah this uh, shareholders approval is relevant only for directors who are not uh, liable to return by rotation Yes. Then someone has put a question: If the deposit taking NBFC, who is also a debt listed entity, but not the high debt listed company, so in the corporate governance report, what need to consider from Chapter C of Schedule Five as per the RBI circular dated April nineteen twenty twenty? ah this comes from you uh, know nbfc standpoint actually for nbfc is rbi has issued a separate guidelines on disclosure in the financial statements which also covers the corporate governance related disclosures where they have said if it's a company is a listed entity they can give the disclosures as uh, applicable for you know under the sebi so this question stems from the fact you know if it is not a high value debt listed entity and it is only a uh, deposit taking uh, and we have seen then what should they follow so in terms of corporate governance requirements actually there is some it's a gray area where you know there is not uh, it's not clearly spelled out between the high value debt listed entity and a non high value debt listed entity because the regulation uh, says that you know one has to comply with schedule 5 corporate governance requirements so that seems to be a no moot moot point in my view actually as of now Sean, if I am not wrong, for NBFC there is a separate uh, corporate governance uh, norms. That is that is there in terms of RBI guidelines. That is there, but after so if it is so if it is a non if it is a non high value debt listed entity, it doesn't require to comply with Chapter Four. That is Regulation sixteen two twenty seven. Correct. It has to simply comply with RBI corporate governance norms only. Right. And as far as Schedule Five is concerned, I don't think even Schedule Five is applicable to such companies because high value. If it is not a high value debt listed, Chapter Four hmm. is not applicable, and Schedule Five is connected to Chapter Four only. Chapter Four, correct, correct. So it is simply it has to comply as far as Chapter Five. It has to comply apart from that thing RBI norms. That's it. In the, in the in case of RBI norms, post this segregation of the you know NBFC is based on the scale based regulatory framework. The earlier norms, you know, I I would say to a large extent has been diluted because now they have categorically said that you know if it is a listed NBFC, they will have to simply adopt the semi uh, norms on the corporate governance in terms of disclosures and all that. Correct. Then another question is there. The high-value debt listed entity, which are established under the specific act of the Parliament, then how to deal with the provisions of related to the composition of the board and committee with the directors appointed by government of India? If if I'm not wrong, even uh, there was some recent uh, no judicial decision wherein it was held that even if it's a PSU. And if it is listed, they still have to comply with the SEBI uh, listing regulations. I'm I'm not able to recollect the exact you know citation. Probably I can share that fine later. Go ahead, Chavit. Yes, sir. So here I have given a gist about the committees, its composition, and the chairperson, and the frequency of meetings that are required here. 
So coming to audit committee, it is uh, dealt with under regulation 18 of SEBI LODR regulations. Uh, the composition of the committee should have minimum three directors, out of which at least a two thirds shall be the independent directors. However, where the company has issued SR equity shares, then uh, all the members should, should be independent directors. So basically, SR equity shares are those equity shares where they have where the equity where the issuers of uh, or shareholders have uh, superior voting rights as compared to the other equity shares of uh, the issuer. And uh, basically, where the chairperson has to be an independent director, the frequency of the meetings shall be like the audit committee should meet at least four times in a year with a maximum gap of uh, 120 days between two meetings. And also, the quorum should be of minimum two members or one third of the members, whichever is greater, with at least two uh, independent directors. As far as nomination and remuneration committee is concerned, uh, uh, composition shall be of at least minimum three directors and all the three and all the directors should be uh, non-executive directors. However, uh, with respect to independent directors, there should be at least two third uh, independent directors and the chairperson of the committee should be an independent director and the NRC committee should meet at least once in a year. It should comprise of minimum uh, two members or one third of the members in the quorum, whichever is greater, having at least one independent director. Then uh, for uh, coming to stakeholders relationship committee, it should have at least three directors. Uh, as far as independent directors are concerned, it should have uh, at least one independent director, where here also if uh, SR equity shares are issued, then the uh, two third of the directors shall be independent directors. The chairperson of SRC committee should be a non-executive director and the committee shall meet at least once in a year and the quorum is not mentioned in the regulations so it may be taken from uh, the terms of references as defined under the, uh, under the schedule of LODR regulations and uh, risk management committees uh, deals with regulation 21 where it states that the composition should be of minimum three members where majority of the members should be from the board of directors only independent uh, it has uh, it has to have at least one independent director and if sr equity shares are issued then two third of the directors shall be independent directors the chairperson of the committee shall be from the member of the board and the com uh, com committee should meet at least twice in a year the quorum shall comprise of minimum two members or one third of the members whichever is greater with at least one member being from the board of directors However, the risk management committee is only applicable to the top listed, uh, top 10, uh, sorry, top 1000 listed entities and high value at listed entities. Just one thing I will let me add, Charme, here is that in case of superior right shares, that what you have mentioned, as you rightly said, superior right shares means superior voting rights. Superior voting rights means normally uh, voting right is one share, one vote in case of. Uh, what's called as your postal ballot or in case of e-voting, only in case of a uh, vote on show of hands, uh, one folio, one vote. In case of superior right equity shares means that for one share, it may be more than one vote. It may be two votes, three votes, depending upon the issue terms. And the second aspect is superior right equity shares can be issued only to the promoters and to no one else. And superior right equity shares have a lock-in period and a predetermined time period also. After that, they have to get converted into normal shares. Yeah, one you. point I would like to highlight with respect to the risk management committee, unlike the other committees, risk management committee is one committee which need not be a purely you know board subcommittee. It can have you know members from the senior management or senior executives of the company. Yes, please go ahead, uh, John. Yes, sir. So policies which are required to be drafted and approved by the high value at listed entities pursuant to the amendments are as follows. The company should have a risk management policy as per regulation 21. It should also have a vigil mechanism policy in place as per regulation 22. The, com the company should also have materiality of RPT policy as per regulation 23. Also, a if the company has subsidiary then material subsidiary policy as per regulation 16 sub regulation 1 clause C. Then preservation of documents policy as per regulation nine shall also be in place. And also uh, the archival policy of the company should be maintained as per regulation 51 sub regulation three. Yeah, this preservation of documents and archival policy, it is a common obligation to all listed entities. It is not under chapter five, but it is in the chapter two, if I'm not wrong, chapter one or two. There is one more question has come. 
I think this is in continuation of the earlier question where that uh, high value items is undergone a change relating to that. Mm -hmm. Is there this refers to the comments on the question relating to the not being the high debt entity in a subsequent period? Not sure if specific if the regulation specifically says so, but the general guidance appeared that once you are covered by chapter four. You may have to continue even if you are outside the threshold limit. That is the comment which is actually applicable. Hello, what is the question? I, I was just lost for one minute. Yeah. No, question is even the debt listing entity. Uh, high value debt listing entity becoming a non high value debt listing entity subsequent year. The participant says, although specifically nothing is mentioned, the general guidance appears that once you are covered, even if you are beyond the threshold, you are below the threshold limit, you have to continue to comply. No, I don't think so because I don't think so. He is, he is, he is talking so. about a chapter yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got, I got it actually from where he is coming. If I am not wrong, it is from regulation 15. Hmm. But According to me, as far as the high value debt listed entities, this is a specific provision is there that they have to comply with regulation 16 to 27. And high value debt listed entity, a definition is also given. The moment you are out of the definition of high value debt listed entity, I don't think you need to comply with that, uh, the, the, the provisions. That, that, is only for, that is only for equity listed companies where, of course, they have to comply once it triggers the applicability will be there, uh, thereafter also. That is, that is not my view on the face of it. However, we may just you know, study that and advise accordingly. I think that is why Shanmogam actually said once this happened, you'll have to write to CV. That's what he mentioned. Actually. Yeah, what I said was like, you know, in case you are coming below the threshold, yeah, yeah, that is and if you are kind of sure that you will not again hit the threshold, then it is, you know, better to write to the stock exchange and intimate. Other because you know some companies you know may raise funds for specific project purpose. So at that time they may be hitting the threshold and then you know after that they may not have any intention to go back and fundraise. So it depends upon you know case to case, you know, uh, you will have to deal with that. Further under the regulation 13, investor grievances are to be placed quarterly in the board. Whether should be again routed to SRC. If yes. The SRC leads to the quarterly meeting. Uh, in my view, it is not necessary because there is no uh, SRC may not be convened every quarter actually. So it can be put up to the board anyway. SRC members are going to be part of the board, and you can also you can always minute it. You know, the SRC members also noted it. And generally, in terms of deadly said entities, in terms of grievance, you know, it will be hardly there, uh, it will hardly be any grievance, there will hardly be any grievance or it will be nil. Unless and until you have issues in interest payments and, you know, delay in interest payments. And, and second thing is, similarly, in case of SRC, you can always pass resolutions by circulation, you don't need to hold uh, uh, fiscal meetings. But however, the larger companies, uh, they do have quarter limits, for example, in Reliance. We have virtually every committee, we have a quarterly meeting, whether it is risk management, whether it is SRC, NRC. I mean, of course, NRC is not there. That is only as and when there is a necessity. But SRC, definitely, we used to have that thing because we want to, we used to confirm to the committee members about the debt listed as well as equity listed compliances. Somebody is actually seeking your guidance. Can mentors have, can recommend any book for CB LODR? Is there any particular publication? See, the way, the way the law is getting evolved every day, my advice to all the participants as well as to myself is that don't depend upon any book. Great. Only depend upon the rule book, that is listing regulations and the Bayer Act of the Companies Act. Great. The reason being, two, three reasons for that. Number one, unlike Companies Act 1956 and SEBI listing agreement, these days, neither the Companies Act nor listing regulations are static. They are evolving every day. And the complexities are there. Everyday evolvement is having its own nuances and complexities. And everybody is interpreting it in their own way and style. So you have to be very, very careful because when I am interpreting and saying something on a webinar, though I need to do with some respect, but at the end of the day, if you are taking my word as a Bible, 
you are the person who is putting your head into the nose. So you have to be very careful. So my advice to all the people, every time in several forums I mentioned this thing is that have your own interpretation, get convinced thoroughly because you are the person at the end of the day who is responsible for your actions. Listen to everybody. At the end of the day, you have your own interpretation and you have your own logic for that and rational for that. Yeah, in terms of LODR, I don't uh, see you know, an equivalent of Ramaya available being available. So whatever book you may purchase, it will become outdated in next three or four months. You will have an uh, outdated book, which is a high risk actually. So it's as Mr. Sudhaka said, you know, it's better to keep track of the you know, amendments and the regulations which are uh, available in the SEBI website. I think that's how See, it that, uh, no, Sean, there was a joke actually recently I, I came across that somebody went to a bookshop and asked by, can, can you please give me the latest uh, commentary on the company's act? He said that, sir, sir it is under, under publication. <laughs> after one month again, he said the same answer. After another one month again, he said the same answer. Yeah, especially the rule that very often, even Ramaya, no, it's very difficult to use now. Yeah, no, correct, no. correct, absolutely. No, no, the way regulators are actually amending the provisions and coming out with various circular, virtually every month we see the amendment, two, three amendment at least coming up. So, really speaking, as Sudhagar puts it here, we cannot depend upon any particular book except on all the same. What we can do is we have to keep updated our notes. Second thing is the authentic site, which itself actually display what are the circular, what are the notification which has actually come up. That is where we have to go. We have to continuously keep updating ourselves. I also think that we must all be thankful to various WhatsApp groups we are in so that we get constantly updated. Otherwise, we'll have to go to the website and see at least we get a you know alert in terms of the you know in the group so that we it, you know triggers us to go to the website and check it. John, we have a public, we have a, um, a monthly uh, bank zone in the name of Vedanam. Mm -hmm. And we update our clients with that. And okay. in case you are interested, uh, we will put your name in the mailing list so that you will get it every month. Sure, sure, please. And also, any amendment, daily updates also we send to all our clients. Correct. Absolutely. So become our client, you will get daily updates. <laughs> <laughs> I wish to. <laughs> Just go. Go ahead, Tommy. Yes, sir. The key implications are as follows. Like the high value rate listed entity has to submit disclosures of related party transactions on a consolidated basis, along with its standalone financial results half yearly. Also, secretarial audit of material unlisted subsidiary incorporated in India is a, a company. Mm -hmm. Uh, every high value debt, li debt listed entity has to take a DNO insurance for all its independent directors. They also have to submit a quarterly compliance report on corporate governance within 21 days from the end of each quarter. It also has to submit a secretarial compliance report within 60 days from the end of each financial year. And also a submission of proceedings of general meetings as per regulation 51 sub regulation 2 read with clause 23 of part B of schedule 3 of listing regulations. See, there is one once we are actually in terms of uh, AGM notice by default, we will give it. In case of any general meeting, it is only when it affects the you know NCD's holders' interest, you will issue the general notice to the exchange. Otherwise, if it is any other business, you need not actually. But in terms of the proceedings of the EGM, whatever is the business, you will have to file it with the BSC. Yeah, Sudhakar, you were saying somebody is asking a question, can NR participate in the debt public or private? Uh, uh, sorry, can you repeat the question, sir? I think can NR, I think non-resident, hmm. participate in debt public can participate either public or private. Can NR participate in the debt public or private? That will be again subject to the FEMA guidelines, no? Yeah, yeah, correct, absolutely. President, whether he can become a, uh, whether he can subscribe to the debt or not, it all purely depends upon the FEMA guidelines. In fact, it, the one has to now re refer to the non-debt instruments regulations, rules of, you know, finance ministry. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, 
disclosures which are required by the high value rate listed entities in their annual report as per schedule 5 stay, uh, are as follows they have to disclose related party disclosures uh, however these disclosures are not applicable to listed banks uh, also mda which is rightly called as management discussion analysis including disclosure of accounting treatments have to be disclosed in their annual reports uh, uh, also uh, an annexure of cg report shall be annexed to the uh, annual report a declaration has to be signed by the ceo stating that member of board of directors and senior managements have affirmed the compliance with the code of conduct of board of directors and senior management and also a compliance certificate from either the auditors or a practicing company secretaries regarding compliance of various uh, conditions of uh, corporate governance shall be annexed with the directors report and also the uh, disclosures with respect to demand suspense account or unclaimed, unclaimed suspense account has to be disclosed in the annual report however with effect from uh, july 15 2023 uh, also this disclosure has been added which states that certain types of agreements binding on listed entities which includes information disclosed under clause 5a of paragraph a of part a of schedule 3 of these regulations are also uh, have also to be disclosed in the annual report there is a question from shaila what is the use of the drr can you all take that yeah see basically this is all you know to uh, debenture redemption reserve is created because the company is having a debt in its balance sheet okay when the debt gets redeemed it gets redeemed out of the profit and your uh, net worth is likely to be impacted because your profit you are transferring to the reserves will become less to ensure that the company is adequately capitalized to meet any future liabilities that is one reason where these you know debenture redemption reserve even for the preference issue of shares you know the uh, redemption reserve is you know uh, prescribed under the company act anything else you may add uh, sudhakar yeah yeah that is correct you know because see basically the the purpose of creating a debenture redemption reserve is that at the time of redemption the company is having at least uh, some kind of uh, resources in case god forbids if there is a liquidity impact or if it is by the time that uh, the securities are coming for a redemption and then the company is into losses for whatever the reason it is and all at least there is some kind of resource are there with which that uh, the redemption can be taken care of if not completely at least to some extent that is number one if you remember that even when the company act 2013 initially mooted the idea of fixed deposit redemption reserve also you know but subsequently uh, in fact you know that uh, sorry yeah yeah that fixed deposit redemption reserve as well as an insurance also for that but no insurance company came forward with any kind of a policy so they withdrew that particular thing you know. so all these are basically to create a kind of a security for the at the time of redemption it is one of the purpose also you know the share premium account or securities premium account also is primarily used for capitalization rather than anything else to ensure that the company has adequate capital actually correct there is another question has come up is the management discussion analysis applicable on debt listed entities request to provide more highlights on this because we have an understanding that it is not applicable and also point g of disclosure slide i think point g here it reads disclosure of a certain type of agreement binding listed entities which includes information disclosed under clause 5a paragraph a of part a of schedule 3 of these regulations the part a schedule 3 is not applicable to debt listed entities it is only part b information which is applicable so in terms of mda for high value debt listed entity it may be relevant because it comes under schedule 5 corporate governance requirements but for nbfc companies shan you know that as per the rbi corporate governance norms md and a is mandatory so yeah. if it is a purely debt listed company if it is not nbfc what shan said is correct but if it is a debt listed and nbfc company NBFC. also in such case though chapter 4 it do it is not a high value debt listed value. if it is a low i mean you know that uh, simplicity of debt listed company but nbfc if not under the listing regulations md and a is applicable as per rbi corporate governance norms you have to prepare a md and a report there is someone is saying we had issued mct during the covid time 
on that time creation of the drr was actually relaxed now drr is mandatory for fresh mcd it is correct. not a nbsc package correct correct you have to create a drr create it only for nbsc and the exemption so. might be for a particular period you know if the exemption period is you have to create now yes go ahead sir yes sir so coming to regulation 52 it uh, states about financial results so uh, the companies has to submit uh, quarterly financial results to stock exchange uh, however for quarter ending june september and december it has to be submitted within 45 days from the end of each quarter and however for quarter ended march uh, uh, march it has to be submitted within 60 days of the uh, end of financial year so also non submission may lead to a fine of rupees 5000 per day as a uh, uh, sir had rightly as uh, sham sir had rightly said that a sebi operational circular was issued in this regard all the penalties and the formats of such uh, regulations and uh, quarterly financial results are also given in the circular so one can also go through such a uh, circular also a copy of the financial results have to be submitted to the the venture holders on uh, sorry debenture trustees on the same day uh, on the on the date which is provided to the stock exchanges and the, the approval and the authentication and publication of annual and quarterly financial results should be accompanied by a limited review report and the quarterly results shall be taken on record by the board of directors and it has to be signed by either a managing director or executive director also a modified opinion in audit reports or limited review report shall be appropriately and adequately addressed to the board of directors while publishing the accounts for the said period yeah in terms of the submission of financial results you should also enclose the statement of utilization of the proceeds of the ncd earlier it used to be within 45 days from the end of the quarter now the regulations have changed uh, effective 14th november 2022 so the statement of utilization also has to be along with the uh, submission of the financial results and in terms of submission to the debenture trustee one also has to submit the asset cover certificate uh, issued by the auditor along with the results to the debenture trustee on a quarterly basis on the same day when you submit it to the stock exchange and the submission timeline is again you know for the financial results it is within 30 minutes of the end of the board meeting and in case if the board agenda has got any items relating to fundraising through ncds the outcome of that also has to be uh so uh, this close to the exchange within 30 minutes okay yeah, go ahead uh, chami yes, one sir. more uh, one more thing i would like to bring here is that uh, on the other day when i was addressing this related party transactions webinar there was a question about whether for uh, high value debt listed entities whether the regulation 23 uh, changes whatever has come in the related party transactions whether they are applicable Answer is yes. Yes, it is applicable. Regulation sixteen to regulation twenty seven, they have to comply with, and in between twenty three is there. So whether you like it or not, regulation twenty three is to be complied with. And somebody was telling, sir, it is very cumbersome. I said, <laughs> question is not very cumbersome or not, but it is applicable to you. Regulation twenty three is applicable to you, despite the fact you are specified securities are not listed. The only debt listed securities are listed. but it is a high value debt listed entity and you have to comply with the provisions so yeah, any the participants are falling in that high value debt listed uh, entity and your securities got listed on the stock exchanges please ensure that regulation 23 is equally applicable and all other compliances too are also applicable to you i would like to highlight one more point there is a sebi discussion paper for the debt listed entities where there is a proposal to obtain the debenture holders approval for the related party transaction beyond certain threshold limits it has not yet come but we need to be mindful of that also which is going to make the life much more difficult actually what is the, what is that come back again proposal to obtain the uh, debenture holders approval for the related party transactions acha acha okay 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 got it got it it has not yet come there is a discussion paper issued by the sebi actually okay Yeah, go ahead, Cham. Yes, sir. So the company also has to submit a statement of a statement of assets and liabilities and statement of cash flows as at the end of uh, of the half year by way of note along with the financial results. 
so the submission of annual financial results shall be either with a modified opinion or an unmodified opinion if there is a modified opinion statement on impact of uh, audit qualifications has also uh, has to be submitted also and also on uh, unmod if the opinion is unmodified opinion then a declaration to the effect uh, has to be submitted to the stock exchange and as uh, shan sir rightly said that along with the financial results we also have to submit a statement indicating the utilization of issue proceeds along with the submission of financial results uh, that uh, that comes into effect with uh, from november 14 2022 and in case of any material deviation in the use of proceeds as compared to the objects of the issue the same should also be intimated and indicated there however along with the financial results as per regulation 52 sub regulation 4 uh, all these ratios and uh, other items shall also be covered here which the which usually we have seen the debt listed entities uh, do not uh, provide this along with their financial results so they, these ratios are of debt equity ratio debt service coverage ratio interest service coverage ratio then the outstanding redeemable preference shares their capital redemption reserve or uh, debenture redemption reserve the net worth net profit after tax earnings per share also their current ratio long term debt to uh, working capital ratio bed debts to account receivable ratio then the current ra liability ratio the total debts to total assets debtors turnover inventory turnover operating margin percent and net profit margin percent has to be disclosed however uh, in case of non disclosure of the above mentioned items shall be liable to pay uh, the, shall be liable for a fine of rupees 1000 per day and uh, these also the financial results uh, along with the above mentioned items have to be disclosed in the newspaper within two working days from the conclusion of board meeting here uh, we need to note that there are there is a timeline of two working days whereas in listed uh, where the companies are which are equity listed company they have to submit this disclosure in the newspaper within 48 hours of the conclusion of board meeting so here i have covered a gist of all the compliances which are applicable to a high value debt listed entities so coming to regulation 3 uh, sorry regulation 7 sub regulation 3 which states a compliance certificate in relation to maintaining a share transfer facility has to be submitted within 30 days from the end of financial year so this is an annual compliance which a debt listed entity has to do coming to regulation 30 yeah, one point i would like to highlight here see in case of unlisted companies unless it is a subsidiary of you know holy one subsidiary it has to have all the shares you know dematerialized so invariably it will need to have a tripartite agreement with the rta and the depository so this is something which the exchanges are also checking so all the debt listed entities needs to be mindful of this requirement uh, to have this you know agreement in place actually yeah go ahead champ Yeah. Also, as per Regulation 13, Sub Regulation 3, statement of investor complaints has to be submitted within 21 days from the end of quarter, and a non-compliance to this would lead to a penalty of rupees 1,000 per day. Then, uh, Regulation 23, 23 Sub Regulation 9 states uh, about uh, applicability of disclosures of related party transaction. They have to be submitted half yearly along with the uh, standalone financial results. Then. Regulation twenty seven sub regulation two deals with compliance report on corporate governance, which has to be submitted within twenty one days from the end of each quarter. Then, as per regulation fifty sub regulation one, a prior intimation about board meeting consisting of all the items mentioned here has to be given at least two working days in advance, where we'll exclude the date of intimation and the date of board meeting. And a non compliance to this would lead to a fine of rupees five thousand per instance of non compliance. Regulation fifty sub regulation two speaks about the AGM or EGM, which is proposed to be held for obtaining shareholders' approval for financial results and for fundraising by way of issuance of non-convertible securities, and where any meeting of the holders of non-convertible securities in relation to the matter affecting the rights or in, rights or interest of the holders, the uh, meeting has to be said by the not later than the date of commencement of dispatchment of notice. and however if this is not complied rupees 5000 per instance of non compliance per item shall be levied on the company yeah in the corporate governance report i'd like to highlight one thing in the quarterly compliance on co report on the corporate governance there is one specific affirmation in the report format which says whether the company has obtained prior approval for the related party transactions 
either you will have to say yes or if you are going to say no you need to give a comment as to why no peer approval has been obtained so one has to be very careful in you know making this affirmation because the annual secretarial compliance report format also the recent one also has a specific line item which says you know whether any rpts have been ratified so if you are going to say here no uh, yes uh, no no uh, all peer approval obtained and the end of the year if there is going to be any observation on the ratification there will be a no dichotomy between these two reports and the company might get into a problem so any ratification done during the course of the year it is to be promptly reported in the corporate governance report saying uh, with the exception that you know some ratification has been done rather than simply saying yes Yes, Chami, go ahead. And as per uh, Regulation Fifty One, Sub Regulation One, any information having bearing on the performance or operation of the listed entity, or either price sensitive information, or any action that shall affect the in payment of interest or dividend or redemption of such non-convertible security, the uh, company shall promptly inform to the stock exchange in this regard. However, promptly shall mean here as soon as reasonably possible, but not later than twenty-four hours. Uh, regulation fifty-two, sub-regulation seven or seven A deals with statement indicating the utilization of issue proceeds or material deviation in the use of proceeds. They have to be submitted along with the quarterly financial results. And uh, in case of non-compliance, rupees thousand per day penalty shall be levied. Uh, regulation 52 sub regulation 8 uh, states that financial results along with the line items as mentioned under regulation 52 4 have to be disclosed within two working days of conclusion of board meeting regulation 53 sub regulation 2 uh, speaks about annual report it's that the along uh, it has to be submitted along with the notice of annual general meeting not later than the date of commencement of dispatch to its shareholders the company has to intimate the stock exchange regarding this And in uh, in case of non-compliance, rupees two thousand per day fine shall be levied. Regulation fifty four sub regulation two and three uh, deal security cover, which have to be submitted along with the financial results either quarterly or yearly. And uh, in uh, in case the company fails to do so, it has to pay a fine of rupees per th uh, rupees thousand per day. Regulation twenty fifty five deals with credit rating, which states that the, each uh, all the companies should get its uh, credit rating at least once in a year. Regulation fifty seven sub regulation one stay uh, uh, speaks about disclosure of information relating to payment obligations, and in case of any payment is to be done to the uh, NCD holders, the same has to be informed to the stock exchange within one working day of becoming due, and um, where the company fails to report such a payment. it has to pay a fine of rupees 2000 per day per isin yeah here i'd like to highlight one point similar to regulation 30 regulation 512 also lists out certain information under schedule uh, 3 part b where the dead listed entity has to give the you uh, know make the disclosure to the stock exchange there are various informations you know relating to the ncds and all that specifically two things i would like to highlight in that one is relating to details of any letter or comments made by the debenture trustee regarding you no know, ncds payment interest payment and all that or any other matter concerning the security so whenever you receive any communication from the debenture trustee you need to be mindful of this requirement so that you don't you know uh, miss to disclose this to the uh, stock exchange in terms of regulation 51 read with schedule 3 part b and one more point we need to be mindful is that you no know, failure to create charge and the assets of the company within the stipulated time period suppose if the company is not filing the charge within the time period provided under the company act or if there is a time period agreed with the investor it is not done then that will also trigger a disclosure to the exchange these two are something which is most likely to be you no know, overlooked so that is the reason i just thought i will highlight it Yeah, go ahead, Jam. Yeah. As per Regulation Fifty Seven, Sub Regulation Four, the company also has to submit the details of the payable obligations during the quarter. So this has to be done within five working days prior to the beginning of the next quarter. And in case of uh, no, failure to do this, the company has to pay rupees one thousand as fine per ISIN. Somebody is asking a question. 
in case of the asset cover is not applicable as it is only a secured debt whether nil certification of the auditors are required or just submitting are not applicable in such situation in case of such a scenario you can you know mention in the you know your covering letter to be submitted to the stock exchange along with the results if it is not applicable you can mention that somebody is asking a question process to be followed for the delisting post to total reduction of the ncd amount my understanding is that for the delisting purposes there is one separate you no know, circular or guideline issued one has to comply with that actually according to according to me it doesn't come as a delisting because that in case of debt listing what happens is the moment you are redeeming the debentures just intimate the stock exchanges because the securities are not going to be in existence in future so right. they have to just close it it, it doesn't fall under the delisting provisions and you will have to distinguish the isin if you are not going to use yeah, the isin ISN is different that's what i was about to come to shan because you have to approach the depository mm. and get the isin also closed earlier people what they used to do was they were not closing the isin they were used to lie uh, along with the depository now the depository says ki bhai you have to get your isins closed also now i if i remember correct the timeline is 2 months within 2 months yeah. you are supposed to correct correct which the isin somebody correct. say ki somebody say the visa amendment the lodr they have amended the regulation 57 will you please guide on that now the regulation 57 is amended there is number 1 2 3 4 4c that's for the participants too. yeah intimation to the stock exchange is actually 57 57 is what the listed entity should submit a certificate to the stock exchanges regarding yeah. status of payment of interest or dividend or repayment or redemption of principal or non convertible securities within one working day all its becoming due in the manner and format as specified by the board from time to time correct so so one day before that you have to intimate to the stock exchanges that these are falling for due for uh, uh, i mean payment or redemption and then uh, you just comply with that i think uh, if i am not wrong uh, uh, charmi in your question i think you are putting that 57 5 or something like that yes sir because I of the also... amendment those things are not there i think that is what the question of the participant i think if i am not wrong so oh, so they are still there in the regulations as per uh, regulation 57 4 in your ppt just so that no no one minute one minute jame in that uh, revised uh, this thing okay This is mm -hmm. uh, this uh, this amendment is from fifteenth June twenty three. Yeah, that is so got. This exactly. regulation has been this regulation has been uh, uh, substituted. I think that with the yes, new yes, one. Yes, yes. Yeah, that is the question. Whether yeah. so, so, so now that uh, one, two, three, four are not there. Yeah, yeah it is that only is one. Four and five uh, are not there now. That way they are telling. Only fifty seven is there now. Fifty seven, one, two, three, four. I think is the regulation is not there now. <clears throat> Correct. 4-5 is not there. They are telling 57-4 and 57-5 requirements are not there now. Correct. 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 Okay. Yeah. Vigilant. Or all participants are panelists. <laughs> <laughs> That's the beauty of this webinar. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, uh, Miss Siddhi and Urvashi. Uh, then uh, coming to regulation sixty sub regulation two, which uh, talks about the record date, uh, where a company fixes a, a record date and advance notice of at least seven working days, excluding the date of intimation, and the record date has to be intimated to the stock exchange. And in case of non-compliance, uh, rupees ten thousand per ISIN has to be uh, paid by, by the company. Uh, also, uh, regulation sixty one sub regulation four uh, read along with regulation forty nine uh, speaks about the certificate from PCS. that uh, has to be submitted by the company within 30 days from the end of the financial year regulation 62 speaks about the updation of website containing the details as per regulation and this has to be done on a continuous basis however in uh, in case of any non compliance and advisory or warning letter per instance will be issued by the uh, stock exchanges for non compliance per item 
However, in uh, however, also rupees ten thousand per instance for every additional or advisory warning letter shall be uh, levied by the stock exchanges. In fact, deep, in fact, of this regulation fifty seven overshared. Siddhi has pointed out this. That's why I used to say in several forums when people say goodbye that uh, in the good old days, once you prepare a presentation, the stand, the the value of that, you know, that uh, stock, I mean, uh, you can hold it in your shelf. Shelf life of that thing is four to five years minimum, if not more. Whereas now the shelf life is not there because when you are going to make a presentation in the morning, once again, you have to check whether any amendment has come to that. One time, one day it happened like that with me. I was making a presentation that day, the previous day night, some, some amendment has come. I was not familiar with that and got caught. <laughs> so I made it a point after that every day before you are going to the venue, just rough through that, run through that by any changes have come. If so, you have to incorporate it. Or put a disclaimer, right? Unless until something comes yesterday night. <laughs> Coming to Regulation 3 uh, and uh, regula Regulation 3, Sub-Regulation 5 and 6 of SEBI PID regulations read with the BSE circular dated March 29, 2023. It has brought uh, an amendment where it stated that the companies to whom the provisions of Regulation 24A of SEBI LODR regulations is not applicable, the companies are required to submit a SDD compliance certificate within 21 days from the end of each quarter. So the companies falling under the purview of high value debt listed companies are not required to comply with the SDD compliance certificate every quarter. However, the companies which are not high, uh, which are not high value debt listed entities, they have to still submit the SDD compliance certificate within 21 days from the end of this, uh, from the end of every quarter. If a high value debt listed entity, this point is getting covered in the annual SERI. Yes. Think. Uh, coming to uh, Schedule B, read with Regulation 9, Subregulation 1 of SEBI PIT regulations, uh, trading window closure shall also be applicable to all the delisted entities, which shall be closed from the end of every quarter till 48 hours after the declaration of financial results. And this has to be done from the end of every quarter. There is somebody has put a question. Listed companies are receiving notices for the non-filing of the regulation, non-filing of the regulation six one and seven three on quarterly basis, referring separate guidance note of the SEBI circular. They are given the reference number, which is actually dated November 13, 2020, regarding the non-compliance with the provision um, related to continuous disclosure. Is it required to intimate about the appointment? A compliant officer every quarter, even if there is no change. But as the regulation stands today, it requires actually. We keep doing that actually, and the November 2020 circular, I think that is get uh, that has been now updated with this uh, July 2022 circular actually, which is updated till December 2022. There's one more question has come. We have only one NCD holder, and the same NCD has been actually listed on the stock exchange. Is closure of the trading window will applicable to this company? They have to. <laughs> With respect to the STD, for new entity, what is the timeline for procuring SDD system and to put in place? Yeah, that has already become applicable. There is no timeline per se, actually. Because immediately, of, immediately. Yeah, in case of equity listed companies, I understand that the stock exchange officials came for inspection also. No, no, what they say is short here it is with respect to SDT for a new entity. No, in new fact, uh, in fact they, would have done, they should have done the homework much before starting the new entity <laughs> itself. What are the things to be done? That should be one of the preparatory things. So that when you actually Starting the new entity, the system should have been in place. Actually, that's what I think so. Not that after new entity comes into the being, you start thinking what are the compliances. You have to do the homework prior to that only. So practically, you no know, companies also take time to appoint KMPs despite being coming into existence. So practically, this will happen after some time 
in my view. No, no, Sushan, it won't be like that because when you are going for listing, they are insisting that you have to have the compliance officer on record already before listing itself. Mm -hmm. So, same is the case with when you are coming with that in principle approval, also they say this thing, who are the KMPs and also most of the companies, even while they are filing the uh, draft lead herring prospectus, it, that time itself, they ensure the KMPs are in place. So, as uh, Balasar has rightly mentioned that whether it is SDD or whatever it is, the moment your security is not listed on the stock exchanges, day one onwards, you have to comply with all the SEBI listing, I mean SEBI uh, regulations. Even PIT regulations is also a part of that. Once you, you, you incorporated an entity and got listed on the stock exchanges, day one, SDD is applicable to you. You have to have the system in place. Actually, uh, as rightly said, when you go for listing, you require a lot of preparation. Rather, as you know, Sudhakar, we give proper yes, yes. actually training to the entire department that if you are going for listing, what all preparation you have to do. You have to do that before you start that process of listing. Correct, Dipti. That is what it is exactly is required to be done. You know, if the bank starts at 10.30, it is not 10.30 we enter into the bank. You should have much before 10.30 the service should be available. Similarly here, if it is a new entity, it is applicable from the day one, your preparatory work should have been done so that the system is actually in place. There's another question comes. Could you please explain the applicability of the safety circular? Data July 1923 to dead listed company with a respect to trading window closure. I think it is relating to that you know designated depository circular. So there is a timeline given for that in case of you know various types of entities there in terms of you know that uh, compliance for that actually. So one has to you know this basically to freezing of the you know pan of the designated persons basically that is relating to. So as per the timelines, one has to comply. In terms of trading window disclosure, uh, anyway, the red listed entity has to close the trading window as Chami was you know, highlighting. Uh, the same thing is the participant is also putting, it is likely with the reference to the pan and ISM impact of designated person. Yeah, yeah, see, that's to avoid the non-compliances. Now, what the depositories are doing is they're asking for the PAN number of the promoters, designated persons, KMPs, and all. Yeah. But the top, uh, that Nifty 50 companies, already it was there in place. What they do is automatically, the moment you announce that with the, that, that uh, next quarter starts, they freeze all the PAN numbers. Till yeah. the time you are, after 48 hours of your board meeting, they defreeze that. Right. So now they're extending that to all the listed companies and uh, over a period of time. That's what they have given it in, okay, in phase wise, they have given that. That is nothing uh, apart from that in July 19 circular. Yeah, go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, Charlie. So, following are the XBRL based compliances which the debt listed companies have to follow. All the debt listed issuers have to follow the submit uh, things in the XBRL mode. Uh, it consists of credit rating, interest payment, redemption payment. In case there is a default in payment of uh, redemption, then financial results, half yearly statement of related party transactions and investor complaints. However, uh, one has to note here that uh, XBR, uh, uh, the record date has to be filed even in the XBR mode as well as in the PDF mode unless under uh, other further notification is issued by SEBI in this regard. Is freezing of the pan is applicable in the debt listed companies as well? Yeah, as per July 19 circular, it is applicable. Yeah, it is applicable now. Yeah, it yeah. is there. Yeah. Go ahead, Chabi. Yes, sir. So these are the documents and information which are required to be given to the uh, uh, security holders as per Regulation 58. The company. Just, uh, uh, just one minute, sir. See, this yes. particular freezing of PAN is arising out of PIT regulations. As we have mentioned earlier, PIT regulations are applicable even to debt listed companies. Hence, freezing of PAN is applicable even to debt listed companies also. Okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. So the company has to send the following documents, which consist of soft copies of annual report to the security holders who have registered their email addresses, a hard copy of documents as mentioned under Section 136 of Companies Act, 
and hard copies of annual report where the security holder specifically asked for it. However, uh, SEBI had uh, SEBI had issued a circular uh, on fifth Jan twenty twenty three where it had provided a re relaxation up to thirtieth September twenty twenty three. For in uh, to comply with the requirements of Regulation Fifty Eight Sub Regulation One Clause D of Listing Regulations. However, uh, Regulation Fifty Eight Sub Regulation Two and Three speaks about notices of all the meetings, stating the provisions for reappointment of proxy as per Section, along with the proxy forms, has to be uh, sent to all the security holders. Coming to the structure of non-convertible securities or uh, non-convertible redeemable preference shares, uh, as per Regulation Fifty Nine Sub Regulation One, any material modification in the structure of non-convertible debentures or NCRPS uh, should not be done without the prior approval of stock exchanges where such securities are listed, and where uh, such approval shall be made only after the approval of board of directors as well as the debenture trustee. And not less than three fourth of the holders by value should give their consent in writing. However, the company can also provide them for a remote e-voting facility to obtain such consent. Regulation fifty nine A deals with draft scheme of arrangement and scheme of arrangement. So, the company who is intending to undertake scheme of arrangement or it is involved in as per section. Two thirty to two thirty four of companies at two thousand sixteen. Uh, sorry, two thousand thirteen, which has listed its non convertible debentures or non convertible redeemable preference shares. It has to file draft scheme of arrangement with the stock exchanges along with a non refundable fee for obtaining a no objection letter. Such a scheme uh, shall not be filed with NCLT unless the company has obtained a no objection letter from the stock exchanges. And uh, such a letter shall be valid for a period of six months from the date of issuance. After which the company has to obtain again a fresh uh, a fresh letter, and upon uh, sanction of such scheme by NCLT, company has to submit documents to stock exchanges from time to time, and the company has to ensure that all the compliances in this regard are done by the company, and these regulations shall not apply to a restructuring proposal approved as a part of resolution plan by the uh, NCLT under Section thirty one of Insolvency Code. Subject to the details being disclosed to the recognised stock exchange within one day of the resolution plan being approved. There's one more question that's coming on the freezing issue. Is freezing of the plan is actually designated person applicable to the net listed companies because in the circular it is written as applicable to equity listed and convertible securities. Companies that equity must include equity, all equity ISN and ISNS. That are convertible into equity. How can they then be applicable to the registered companies if the circular is freezing up? Fine. See, maybe, uh, maybe they are actually in the see phase wise they are extending this particular pan. I mean, the freezing of the pan is concerned. Maybe in the first phase they are not covering the debt listed entity. If that circular says like that, it is applicable only to the convertible securities. It may be so. But ultimately, at the end of the day, this is uh, arising out of bit regulations, and over a period of time, they will extend it to even to the debt listed companies also. Yeah, nevertheless, it is uh, ideal for the company to approach the NSDL for you know uh, appointing them as a designated depository. So there, some clarity will emerge on the timelines for compliance in this regard. Yeah. Yes, sir. In terms of non-convertible debt securities and non-convertible redeemable preference shares are dealt under Regulation 61. Uh, Regulation 61 Sub-Regulation 1 states that a company shall ensure timely payment of interest or dividend of non-convertible securities. However, they should not declare or distribute dividend where it has defaulted in payment of interest or dividend or redemption in or in creation of security. Uh, Regulation 61 Sub-Regulation 2 has been omitted. Hence, I have directly mentioned Regulation sixty one sub Regulation three, which states that company shall select its listed securities for redemption on pro rata basis or by lot unless the terms of issue such provides. Regulation sixty one sub Regulation four speaks about that the company should ensure compliance of Regulation forty for transfer and transmission of securities. Regulation sixty one a deals with unclaimed securities and benefits. 
it states that the listed entity should not forfeit any unclaimed interest dividend or redemption amount it shall transfer such amount if not claimed within 30 days to an escrow account which is opened by the company in 7 days and existing unclaimed amount shall be transferred to escrow account within 30 days amount in the escrow account should remain uh, remaining unclaimed for 7 years the same shall be transferred to ipf account while provisions relating to ipf were present in companies act 2013 Inclusion in LODR is targeted towards entities which are not governed by Companies Act 2013. For uh, Regulation 62, following disclosures shall be made by the company on their we uh, websites, which states that the details, uh, which should mention details of the business. Notices of board meeting where financial results shall be uh, discussed. Uh, then financial results have to be disclosed on the website as well. annual reports contact information about the designated officials who shall assist and handle the investor grievances email addresses for the grievance redressal name of the debenture trustees with full contact details any information report notices or call letters circulars proceedings etc concerning the non convertible redeemable preference shares or non convertible debt securities all the information and reports including compliance reports and information with respect to default by issuer to pay interest or redemption amount failure to create a charge on the assets all credit ratings that have been obtained by the company statements of their deviation or variation in case of any annual returns as per section 92 of companies act shall also be mentioned on the website of the company you have covered a few circulars which are required to be complied by the debt listed entities a sepi circular dated august 10 2021 which is now updated as on april 13 2022 requires the company to issue a sub, to submit a statement to the stock exchange where its debt securities are listed as well as to the depositor containing the data in the format as prescribed in that circular within 15 days from the end of every half year so ideally they have to comply, uh, submit the statement by 15th april and october uh, 15th respectively Also, a SEBI circular dated May May twenty seven two thousand nineteen states that the company should furnish a updated list of debenture holders to the debenture trustees by the issuers or registrar to an issue and share transfer agent by seventh working day of each month. A SEBI circular uh, the SEBI circular dated August twenty twenty one updated as on April thirteen twenty twenty two also states that the issuer shall inform the stock exchanges depositories and debenture trustees. on the updated status of payment of the debt securities which is to be done latest by the second working day of april of each financial year however here a master circulate uh, circular for listing obligations and disclosure requirements for non convertible securities securitized debt instruments and uh, commercial paper was issued by sebi as on july 29 2022 which is now updated as on 30th june 2023 which prescribes the formats of the compliances to be done by the debt listed entities and penalties in case of any non compliances are mentioned in the circular so coming to the framework for enhanced borrowing by large corporates so uh, how does the applicability of this framework works it states that the company that have specified their security that have specified securities or debt securities or ncrps listed on a recognized stock exchange and have an outstanding um, a long term borrowing of rupees 100 crore or above and also have a credit rating of aaa and above shall uh, shall be applicable to them any outstanding long term borrowing shall mean any uh, outstanding borrowing with an original maturity of more than 1 year and it should ex exclude external commercial borrowings and intercorporate borrowings between a parent and subsidiary company where an issuer has uh, multiple ratings from multiple rating agencies highest of such ratings should be considered for determining the applicability of such framework however all the conditions uh, stated above have to be fulfilled simultaneously so a large corporate uh, has uh, shall raise minimum 25% of its incremental borrowings during the financial year subsequent to the financial year in which it is identified as a large corporate by way of issuance of debt securities so basically what are incremental borrowings they are the borrowings done during a particular financial year with an original maturity of more than a year 
irrespective whether such borrowing is for refinancing or repayment of existing debt or otherwise it shall exclude external uh, commercial borrowings and intercorporate borrowings between a parent and subsidiary so the disclosure requirements for large entities are as such uh, within 30 days from the beginning of financial year the company should state whether it is identified as a large corporate or not and where the company has been identified as a large corporate they have to submit within 45 days of the end of the financial year the details of the incremental borrowings done by the company during the financial year the disclosures have to be certified both by the company secretary and uh, the chief financial officer of the company so the compliance the compliance by a large corporate goes as follows for financial year 2020 and 2021 they had to comply on an annual basis however from financial year 2022 onwards they have to comply over a continuous block of 2 years however your uh, sebi had released a, a press uh, sebi has released a press release on uh, march 29 2023 which stated that 25% incre uh, incremental borrowings are to be achieved in a block of 3 years instead of 2 years however no such circular has been issued by sebi in this regard so we may still consider this as a uh, 2 years however if at the end of 2 years uh, there is a shortfall in the requisite borrowing a, a penalty or fine of 0.2% of the shortfall shall be levied and the same shall be paid to the stock exchange so for instance if a company is identified as a large corporate as on 31st march 2022 and the board proposes to borrow money of rupees suppose 500 crores so as per the frame applicability of the framework borrowing of borrowing from the debt secured has to be 25% of rupees uh, 500 crores so which comes to 125 crore and if the company uh, borrows actually an amount of rupees only 25 crores so it has a timeline for compliance within the block of 2 years that is 2022 and 23 and financial year 2023 and 24 so if any shortfall of rupees 100 crore it if is not complied within the block of 2 years then a penalty of rupees 0.2% of 100 crores which comes to 20 lakhs shall be uh, levied on the company yeah so that's it sir from my end excellent charmi excellent uh, thank you thank you it is a very preparation very yeah. detailed you have gone through and one more thing i also like to appreciate is the excellent flow of your speech with a distinctly you know in a continuous flow in a very very simple understandable language great job you have done chami my thank great you, appreciation sir. to you thank you very exhaustive presentation chami i i'm sure it would have been extremely useful to all the participants thank you sir chami there are already appreciation there excellent presentation thank you so much very nice session yeah. thanks a lot no thanks wonder coming to panelist and as well as presenter yeah wonderful okay uh, i think there is no more question there were uh, few hands were raised but now it is removed so i hope everyone has uh, got the answer yeah chat box all the questions have been answered yeah and that uh, thanks everyone uh, for your participation and active participation putting the presenter and panelist also on the toes keep it, it up with the 106 people are there normally in any webinar you know at the end of the webinar people the count will come down still your count of three digit is there <laughs> yeah yeah thanks everyone for your uh, time and uh, your participation thanks a lot thanks mr shan for your time thank you. thank you it is my honor and privilege to part of this webinar i have also learned quite a bit in this Thanks a lot. Thanks everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Chami. Thank Thanks you. Thanks Sudhakar. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Sudhakar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, for six friends. Yeah. Have a good good weekend. Yeah. Thank you. Wish you the same. Bye.